Good morning, and welcome to worship with Peace United Church of Christ in Santa Cruz, California, on this third Sunday after Epiphany, January 24th, 2021. My name is David Patti, and it is my joy to serve as pastor of this open and affirming church with its bold vision of living out the good news of Jesus Christ. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. If you're new among us or just haven't connected yet, I hope you'll check our website and Facebook pages to find information about our study and fellowship groups and other programs and service opportunities. Please note especially our webinar exploring Rachel Mikva's new book, Dangerous Religious Ideas, which looks at the deep roots of self-critical faith in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. You do have to register, but it's free and still open. It's okay to join us midstream. I was so grateful that the inauguration of our new president last week included a poem commissioned for the event. It's not actually an established custom. The first one, interestingly enough, was Robert Frost at John Kennedy's inauguration in 1961. And it didn't happen again until Maya Angelou delivered On the Pulse of the Morning at the Clinton inauguration of 1993. Amanda Gorman, our first National Youth Poet Laureate, shines bright in that tradition of Frost and Angelou, Miller Williams, Elizabeth Alexander, and Richard Blanco. She offered on Wednesday a poem that I heard as a prayer in the spirit of our worship service this morning, invoking the call to form a new community of good news for all people. Here's some of what she offered. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright when the day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Amen. So let us Listen for God's call in this moment. Together in faith, together in hope, together in gratitude to the one from whom all blessings flow.
God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? God is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? One thing we ask of God that will we seek after. To live in God's house all of our days, to behold God's beauty, and to follow in the way of God's truth. reading from the letter to the Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you. My brothers and sisters, what I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Fred, not thyself, because 
patiently for him. Wait patiently for him. Oh, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. And he shall give thee thy heart's desire. The Gospel According to Mark Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As they went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. 
Did he really believe that was within reach? Where do we find now, where have we ever seen groups of people in sustained agreement with no divisions among them? I'm not aware of it in history, even in so-called utopian communities, and it seems that the contemporary trend is quite the opposite, life devolving into smaller and smaller units with less and less that holds us together. The big ideas and higher callings that drew us into association and common cause do not appeal in the way we had once believed or hoped. And the whole world appears to be unraveling in a snarl of identity politics. Are you a Democrat or a Republican? An evangelical or a progressive? A socialist, a capitalist, a libertarian or liberal or conservative? These distinctions are now less variations on a theme than they are opposing tribes, less things that we discuss and more things that we fight over. Where and how do we build community when common cause is reduced to a single perspective held within a tight boundary? When so often we hear ultimatums to the effect of you're either with me right now on this one or you're against me. There is good and evil, right and wrong. And I don't think you can negotiate with the devil. But do we need to look at every difference and conflict, even important differences and conflicts, do we need to look at them all as if they were all the battle of Armageddon? Are such battles always coming out of our convictions in the truth for which we would sacrifice, or are they coming too often from pride and selfishness, anger and fear? Are there no growing edges, developing understandings, opportunities for new connections in the right ideas that I have, and maybe even in the mistaken opinions that other people hold? One of the things I know from the last 60 plus years of my life is that responding to the big questions of life I have changed my mind many times. And as I travel through the decades across cultures and all over the world, I'm not remembering anyone I ever met who was trying to get it wrong. I'm very much aware that I'm speaking now as a white cisgender male who has enjoyed a lifetime of privilege and advantage. But I am also a human being who has been broken and rebuilt many times. I have learned and turned through countless occasions of repentance and recreation in the good news of Jesus Christ. I have come to be an ally of people who might once have seen me as enemy. And I now count among my friends, many who once wished me ill. Now, after John was arrested, think about that right there, those words. After John was arrested and the perilous nature of the moment was plain for all to see, after John was arrested, Jesus built his ministry with poor people in the sticks. He went to the Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. 
repent and believe in the good news. And as he passed along the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen, and he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed, so also with James and John, who were in the boat mending their nets, Jesus called to them, and they followed him. The old joke on this passage is that the fishing must not have been very good that day. For how else can we understand what happens in a dangerous setting of a difficult time? A perfect stranger comes along and without setup or explanation extends an invitation that rings with undeniable and irresistible truth. You know, friends, the future you want isn't going to come that way. Fishing is okay, but you're going after the wrong catch. Put down your nets, follow me. And together, we will fish for people. Together, we are going to angle for a new day for all of us. The challenge that comes to me when I revisit this story, hear this call to repentance, the challenge that comes to me is a question which I'll share with you. What are you fishing for? And how's it going? Do you look ahead with hope, energy, courage, and confidence? In what truth have you invested? To what purpose have you entrusted the shaping of your future? Too often, I suspect, our vision arrests in the project or cause of the hour without caring into the relationship with God and neighbor, which can be our purpose in every moment. From the March of Dimes to churches, movements fixed on a problem, an issue, or a particular situation will soon enough run out of gas and lose their drive. Going again to the biblical imagery, the waters get fished out. It's hard to trust this story of Jesus calling his first disciples. There are so few details and so many questions left unanswered. Even if it wasn't going that well, and we know that it wasn't, how could they just turn from what they were doing to follow him? It's hard to trust this story. Until you're prepared to see that it turns on the truth. I've done some fishing. And I'm not sure that baiting and luring, hooking or netting, gutting, cooking, and consuming make an easy association with Christian invitation to relationship with God and building up the community of faith. I suspect those with whom we wish to share the good news of Jesus Christ wouldn't think of themselves as fish and wouldn't like the idea of being fished. Even so, I have to admit that the metaphor rings true because of my own experience. In Jesus Christ, I have been caught and transformed by a love that hooks me and won't let me go, try as I might, like as I may, to wriggle away. It's not so much that I found what I wanted in Christianity. It's more that in Christ, I have been taken by a love I can't live without. That follows me, guides me, and calls to me whatever I am doing and wherever I go. The prevailing culture tells us that religion is something we consume. Religions of the prevailing culture culture promise to do for us at a measured, manageable cost to make us better, happier, stronger, more effective, maybe even richer. Christianity, I believe, makes no such promises. 
Rather, as Christians, we are caught by a meaning that moves through all our conditions and circumstances, that takes us for a lifetime, filling us with a love that is our purpose and our joy, come what may. From generation to generation, the issues change, but the purpose remains the same. Paul said to them and says to us, now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Our unity in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't remove or invalidate our differences among ourselves or with the world around us. But it does call us into a larger view, a larger perspective and commitment. God is love. God made us in love, and God made us for loving, all of us. And not just when it's easy or obvious, but most especially when and where it's difficult. That's where we are called to be our most creative. That's where we are called to be most like the one in whose image we are made. This doesn't remove our right or our responsibility to differ and disagree and dissent. Paul is saying rather that it is time we take seriously our call to communion in Christ. Submitting all our opinions, proposals, and preferences, all our interests and actions to the test of how they serve the purpose of the church, encouraging the faithful, welcoming the seeker, and building up the body of Christ, living into God's justice and mercy and peace. On the way to that end, there will most often be room and occasion for all of us to learn and grow. So let's always be looking for those waters and the chance to go fishing. Friends, the time is at hand and God's kingdom has come near. Repent, turn, and live into the good news. To the glory of God, amen.
Friends, let us pray. O oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus Christ. Fill us and all creation with that word afresh, so that by proclaiming your joyful promise and singing of your glorious hope to all peoples, we may become one living body of witness and praise. You who welcomes all in love, hear our prayers of thanksgiving and petition, turning to you the font of our health and hope, justice and peace. We thank you for the light of this new day and the blessings of rains. We celebrate the peaceful transition of our nation's leadership and our president's call to unity. Guide our leaders and watch over our people, O God, that we may be a nation of liberty and justice for all. We continue in prayer for the Owen family, Doug and Kristen, Kira and Megan. We pray for Linda and Mary and all who live with cancer. We pray for Elaine and those who struggle with addiction. We pray in gratitude for the development of COVID vaccines, and we ask your spirit to guide and strengthen those who manage the distribution and administration of those vaccines. We pray for medical workers and first responders and all who serve for our health and safety, hold them and protect them, that they may know your healing spirit, especially close in these dangerous days. And we pray for the rest and peace of your children, more than 400,000 who have died from COVID-19 and for their grieving loved ones. God of every land and nation in whose image all people are made, hear the joys and concerns of those who pray to you and grant that as we proclaim the greatness of your name, all people will know the power of your love at work in the world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Awake and active in a ministry that heals and helps, we are witnesses to a love God has given us to share you are invited to live into that good news. On the screen now, there is a web address where you can give online and another where you can make a pledge to ongoing financial support of our mission. Know that we rejoice in all you do to support and advance our mission and ministry in serving justice and seeking peace. Thank <laughs> you.
please join me in covenant. We covenant with God and with each other to walk together in all God's ways as the holy is revealed to us, to give ourselves freely and without reserve to Jesus' ministry in this church, to celebrate through worship God's amazing gifts of unity and diversity, to take up Christ's mission around the world, striving for justice and peace, to care for the earth and all her creatures, reconciling ourselves to them in love. For God gives immeasurable grace into all life and every life. Amen. So now go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted. Honor all people loving and serving God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always, now and forevermore. Amen.